Good morning, everyone. My name is Daniel Hector Guimera, and I'm here to talk to you about the funeral industry, existing burial practices, and cemetery design. This is a very sensitive and personal subject, but it needs to be discussed in the design world. <clears throat> uh, as stewards of the earth, we need to have this discussion as to the issues that we're facing in this funeral industry and the solutions for them. All cultures and religions have their own unique customs for laying their loved ones to rest. I'm not here to challenge those wonderful tradi traditions, but instead to implement sustainable practices for them. In the beginning, we had small local cemeteries at church graveyards. Um, and then in 1831, we had the Rural Park Cemetery Movement, which began with uh, Mount Auburn Cemetery in the outskirts of Boston, Massachusetts. This uh, gave us cemeteries with tranquil park-like settings with intimate people scale spaces, uh, along with mixed use opportunities in these park-like settings. For economic purposes, at the end of the 19th century, the funeral industry pushed uh, the modern cemetery design, which was vast open lawns, little to, lo little to no tree canopy, to make use of the land for as many burial place spots as possible, because that equated to more money. Each year, 22,000 cemeteries in the United States bury 90,000 tons of steel, 2,700 tons of copper, 1,636,000 tons of reinforced concrete, and 800,000 gallons of embalming fluid. It's no surprise that these practices are not sustainable. We're running out of space. To name a few cities, Boston, New York, London, and Paris uh, have 10 to 15 years in their cemeteries in their cities until they're fully uh, um, capped you know, to capacity. Uh, and, and this actually has hit home recently. In Eden Memorial Park in Mission Hills, which is a suburb in Los Angeles, um, it's a Jewish cemetery. They're trying to make use of as much space as possible. Um, so inadvertently what happened is that they're digging too close to existing vaults, destroying them, human remains are falling out of them, and then they actually discarded the human remains. In New York, they're enacting laws um, of a 75-year rule. So if plot X is uh, un um, unattended by family members, they will resell it and reuse it. In London, they're burying three to four uh, plots deep. So basically, they disinter the existing, and they bury three to four caskets deep. Uh, but the worst one of all is moving our sacred spaces, our cemeteries, out of the city, as you can see in this diagram. The reason that this is, um, I'll let Christopher Alexander, a quote from Christo Christopher Alexander, a uh, prominent um, author in the design world, uh, let you know why this is bad. Uh, no people who turn their backs on death can be alive. The presence of the dead among the living will be a daily fact in any society, which encourages its people to live. Being in close proximity to these sacred spaces is important for cultural and religious reasons. Um, and if we move these sacred spaces away from the cities to the outskirts, we're destroying these traditions that have lived on for hundreds and hundreds of years. So as spaces, um, as, the, as the need for spaces increases, the price of a funeral will increase. Right now we're looking at upwards of $10,000 for a funeral. This is causing a lot of people to go towards cremation. Uh, by 2021, we're looking at about a 60 to 65% rate of cremation here in the United States. Um, an expert at, um, or a veteran at Forest Lawn Cemetery that has been there for over 25 years, inform me that over 50% of those people that choose cremation, actually the loved ones, they take the cremated remains back with them. So they don't inter them there at the, at, the, at the funeral home or at the cemetery. The reason for this is because there's a disconnect with that cemetery space. It's not a part of the community and there's, not, it's not a, um, uh, there's no sense of place. So that's a huge chunk of the population. So my question is how do we design um, for these changing trends in the funeral industry? Well, let me take you on a journey and let you know how we can do that. So my thesis statement is to reimagine and retrofit urban and suburban cemeteries to ensure their sustainability for future generations and implement new cemetery design into our neighborhoods. These spaces will provide the community a platform to tell their stories, memorialize their history and roots, <clears throat> and, and most importantly, to celebrate life. Before I got into my designs, I had to understand sacred spaces. I had to take it to the core and see what all these sacred spaces had in common. And I discovered that their common element was layered access, going into a large space to a more confined, intimate space. Um, and you can see my diagrams of various different religious centers around the world. That led me to my layered access concept of active, passive, and sacred spaces. In the active spaces, the program elements would be mixed use opportunities, farmers markets, open green space, uh, transit connectors, pedestrian plazas, children's areas, and natural habitats. 
The passive space is an intermedium between the active and the sacred. This is a gathering place for family and friends of the loved ones that are interred in the sacred space. This is an extension of them. So this would be passive gardens uh, for contemplation with family and friends. And then finally in the sacred space, that would be for the interment of our loved ones and for religious centers as well. My two goals for this project are one, to revitalize existing cemeteries that are filled to capacity and uh, convert them into sustainable sacred spaces with layered access that connects to the surrounding community. Goal number two is to create a new language for sacred spaces. Create pocket sacred spaces that are localized for that particular neighborhood itself. So I needed to find two different sites in order to apply these goals. One site with an existing cemetery that needed to be revitalized, and then a separate site that I could apply goal number two with a space that did not have any uh, sacred space for the interment of, uh, of our loved ones. In addition, I looked for communities with rich history, sense of culture, and also uh, religious centers around that area. So I found Boyle Heights in the Arts District. Boyle Heights is just east of downtown Los Angeles, east of the Los Angeles River, and then Arts District is just um, uh, south of downtown Los Angeles. Here you see my master plan uh, diagram. I have allocated four different sites to apply my goals. Goal number one would be applied to Evergreen Cemetery in Boyle Heights. Goal number two would be applied to what I call Boyle Core, um, Boyle Heights Core, which is uh, on the intersection of Soto and Cesar Chavez. Then down at the Sixth Street Viaduct, I would apply goal number two to the spaces underneath the bridge after the, during the renovation of the Sixth Street Viaduct. And then finally, the Arts District, um, the Arts District Core, where I, I would apply goal number two. <clears throat> the regional connector for these spaces is a concept that I call memory tree concept. It's something that I'm uh, providing to the funeral industry to create a, a, a norm in that industry. Basically, when our loved ones pass, we donate a tree in their remembrance, and this will uh, populate our streets and our parks um, and be an extension of our loved ones that are laid to rest in these sacred spaces, connecting these, uh, th that would be a regional connection for these sacred spaces. <clears throat> So for the purposes of my presentation, I'm presenting to you Evergreen Cemetery and the Arts District. So first, Evergreen Cemetery was established in 1877. It has uh, over 300,000 interments. It's a 67-acre plot of land. Uh, just so you have an idea, a football field is 1.3 acres. Uh, its neighbor is uh, the Los Angeles uh, County Crematorium. And uh, originally, this area, Boyle Heights and Evergreen Cemetery, this area was inhabited by the San Gabrielino Native Americans, the Tongva. Uh, and then we had many immigrants come into Boyle Heights, African Americans, Japanese, Chinese, Jews, Russians. Right now, Boyle Heights is, uh, has a 100,000 uh, people population with 95% Latino. So for Evergreen Cemetery, I'm implementing goal number one, which is to revitalize the cemetery. So how do we do this? Well, there's a two-step process. This is the concept is the first phase is res restoration and documentation. Now, in order to do this, I'm going back to a, a tradition that dates back to Native Americans. It's practiced with uh, existing countries in Latin America, uh, practiced in Indonesia, Taiwan. It's called secondary burial. The, the process of secondary burial is that you inter the body. Then after five to seven years, you disinter the body. And at that point, the body has decomposed. So all that's left is the skeletal remains. Then that goes into a smaller capsule. And then it is reinterred into a family plot to save room. And it's just a tradition that has been around for thousands of years. So what I'm proposing to do is to revitalize the cemetery in order to make it sustainable for future generations is to disinter the existing, reinterring them into a datum of history, what I call. That's phase number two. This datum is central to the site, and it will tell a chronological story of the site itself. <clears throat> um, so the concept is this layered access concept. When I apply it to the site, you get this movement from uh, west to east of active, passive, and sacred. And you can see the breakup right here of those spaces. In the green, you have the active. Purple, you have the passive. And then the blue, you have the sacred. Um, I have allocated 20 acres for active space. So again, we're transforming the cemetery into a park-like setting that will bring in the community um, and uh, bring people into the space. Existing, the only entrance into the cemetery was right here. I'm providing gateways all around the cemetery to invite the community. I'm recessing the walls all around the site by 50 feet back to, uh, in, uh, to uh, design a parklet that surrounds the community, the, the cemetery with um, dedicated bike lanes and running paths. Existing, there is a dedicated uh, running path at the cemetery. 
I'm moving the existing Mercado, which is right here. Mercado is a marketplace where they sell uh, food and different goods. And in the existing Mercado, there's also a restaurant. So I'm moving that from that location to here to be more centralized for the cemetery and also to have a more open space for the community to come in. Uh, they are invited by this overhead canopy, this large overhead canopy space for mixed use opportunities for farmer's market, uh, concerts, uh, food trucks, what have you. Um, and then we have uh, up here at this corner of the site, we have uh, Tongva village and a uh, natural habitat to pay homage to the original inhabitants of Boyle Heights. And it follows a, a bioswale that goes through the site collecting runoff. Uh, currently at Evergreen Cemetery, you have a drainage channel that runs through. So I'm working with the topography and drawing all the runoff water to this bioswale. Uh, it's gonna be filtered through a process of phytoremediation, which is cleaning the water with plant material. And then it is stored in the um, underground in a cistern and uh, filtered through ozone techniques and then uh, readmitted to the site for irrigation purposes. And then as we move into the passive area where, the, uh, where we are going to reinter the original habitants of Ever Evergreen Cemetery, we move into the, this concept of memory walls. Memory walls are an extension of our loved ones. Uh, when our loved ones are interred in this space, we're going to add our name, their names to this wall and it'll be an extension of, of them. It'll be a place where we can come together with family and friends and uh, um, recollect about their, their past. And it'll be a digital media, media that you can look up their names and uh, read their story and, and, and see their pictures and what have you. And then the, uh, the walls will be ador adorned with um, uh, murals from local artists from the community. <clears throat> oh, also in the active space, I'm adding a metro stop uh, in, the, about, uh, in the early 2000s. Metro excavated this area of the cemetery and actually moved remains, um, about 150, to an, another area of the site. So right here, this uh, metro goes subterranean, so I'm adding a stop right here because this is going to be a very active, um, bustling center for, for the community. <clears throat> now on to my uh, new burial techniques. Uh, that's moving into this uh, sacred space right here. I'm allocating 34 acres for sacred burials. Um, this new burial technique is taking um, techniques from Native Americans uh, of burying uh, their loved ones in an upright position. Uh, the reasoning behind that was that the soul lives on and um, therefore they bury the, the body in an upright position. By, uh, by doing this, it allows for three interments per 60 square feet versus uh, the traditional 90 square feet for three interments with traditional burials. By doing this upright burial, I'm able to plant uh, trees every three plots, creating a tree canopy, a sense of space, and a more intimate um, experience, which you can see here in this perspective. And this perspective shows a bios the bioswale running through the sacred space, and off in the distance you see the, um, uh, the sacred burial sites. So again, here what I'm doing is I'm creating a rural park cemetery in a sustainable manner that benefits the user and the owner. Um, oh, and I didn't mention. Uh, the spaces would be reused on a 25-year cycle to allow for decomposition and visitation. So again, this is a sustainable site that can be re reused for generations to come. Now we move into the Arts District. Originally, it was inhabited by grapevines, orange groves, then came the factories and railroads uh, for, uh, during World War II, then moved in the artists during the 60s and the 70s, and then finally it was gentrified to the vibrant community we see today. Here I'm applying goal number two of pocket sacred spaces. Again, these are localized uh, neighborhood sacred spaces for the existing community. <clears throat> I'm also uh, connecting to the surrounding context of the site, which is um, uh, Little Tokyo. Little Tokyo has several churches around the surrounding area. So again, I'm applying my memory tree concept, layered access, connecting the churches to the sacred space, in addition, connecting the arts district core to the sacred space. <clears throat> So the journey starts at this uh, pedestrian entrance here on Traction. You enter the site, it draws in the community from the, uh, from the Little Tokyo Arts District Metro Station. Then you move through the site to an uh, uh, overhead canopy area that would be for mixed use opportunities. I'm allocating two and a half acres of open park space that is much needed in the Arts District. Uh, I'm doing this by taking the parking subterranean um, and then we move into the sacred space where we'll have raised uh, planter beds of quarantine steel for in the interment of, cre of cremated remains that are biodegradable and can be reused. <clears throat> so
So my, my objective today was to rattle the cage, to inform you of a topic that is rarely discussed, to get a discussion going. The problem is real and needs to be addressed. My concepts and designs will solve these issues in the funeral industry and focus on the celebration of life. So I urge that this discussion starts today. Thank you. Thank <clears throat> you. <laughs>